morning, Breakwater family. Good morning. Happy Sunday. I'm going to start off with uh, Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verses 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. I'm sure we can find our story in there too. So let's praise the Lord this morning mm-hmm. for all the good things he's done for us. Yes, it's great, great to be a child of God. There's a place where mercy reigns and never Streams of grace flow deep and wide. All the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down at the cross.
There's this king of glory Pursues me with his love And haunts me with a cheering Of his softly spoken words My conscience a reminder
All glory to you, Lord. Thank you so much for this life you've given us, Lord, this beautiful day. And as part of your family, the second life you've given, Lord, thank you so much for so much grace and mercy that when we were once your enemy, you still loved us and you still wanted us to come to you, Lord. Mm -hmm. I just pray for those, if there's anyone here who hasn't yet made a commitment, commitment to the Lord that uh, they would know that he's real and they would feel it today, the spirit. And Lord, just thank you so much for sending the spirit and thank you so much for saving us. We love you. And uh, we pray this in your precious son, Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Take a second and uh, greet each other. Say what's up. Greet each other. <laughs> Spread some love. All right, all right. Make your way back to your seats.
Okay, sounds good. Make your way back to your seats. All right. I have a few announcements for you, Breakwater, a really exciting one. Um, I'll, I'll kick it off with the exciting one. So Chris Eggleston, he passed his test. I don't know if you guys probably heard that before, but um, uh, yeah, he passed his COVID test. So he's actually been flying back. He's been flying back and he arrives tonight at uh, 545 at Bradley Airport. Where's Bradley Airport? Oh, okay, so it's LAX. Yeah. Okay, so he arrives tonight at LAX at 545, and Chris Treegarthen is going to go with a sign and do the whole sign thing. You know, welcome back. We love you, brother. You're our brother in Christ, you know? Make him feel loved. So if you guys want to join that tonight at 545, maybe we'll do that too. Hmm, Got to talk to my wife. Uh, so the church is still doing cleanups on Saturday from 11 to 2 p.m., uh, has anyone, yeah, they switched it. It used to be Friday, now it's Saturday. Has anyone joined that yet? Yeah. Cleanup crew, yeah. Um, no one's joined that yet, so maybe you want to, do, you've done it? Bella, Bella has, Bella's not here. She, I think she's going off to college. Vegas, awesome. Um, so those are all the uh, announcements I have for you guys today. Kurt is in Yosemite. He's probably floating down the mighty merced right now enjoying decompressing maybe from the africa trip i'm not sure but uh yeah we're gonna have some time of tithes and offerings through the desert longing for my home all my dreams have gone astray when I'm blinded in the valley and I'm tired and all alone it seems I've lost my way go run into your mountain where your mercy sets me free you are my strong tower Shelter over me, beautiful and mighty, everlasting King. You are my strong tower, fortress when I'm weak. Your name is true and holy, and your face is all I see. In the middle of my darkness, in the midst of all my fears, you're my refuge and my hope. When the storm of life is raging and the thunder's all I hear, speak softly to my soul. Go run into your mountain where your mercy sets me free. You are my strong tower, shelter over me, beautiful and He sets me free.
I'm up here to uh, confirm the Word of God during for tithes and offerings. But before that, I saw this down here while Clarence was making an advance. Kurt is in Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yosemite. Oh, they're, in, they're a volunteer group that clean the mighty Merced River from the top of the valley all the way down to the bottom. And so they've been doing this for a number of years. And they were chosen in 2014 to be the volunteer group of the year. And this is their, their uh, trophy. So hallelujah. Kurt, I know you're busy in, in the Merced River. And we ask that God would bless you and thank you for all that you've done. You know how we've changed a nation in Malawi. Well, every year we clean the Merced River and you can see the garbage. We have a picture of the, of the team and the garbage collected in 2014. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. This is the first day of the week. And what you do today will affect you the rest of the week. So the Word of God says in Acts 27, forsake not the assembly of the church. Paul was going to leave when he gathered the people together. And so he was going to talk. The Bible says he was going to talk. Well, he talked and talked. And there was a guy sitting in a window, three stories up, fell asleep during the message. How many of you done that before? <laughs> he fell into a sound sleep, fell out of the window, three stories down. And it looked like he was dead. So Paul stopped talking, went outdoors, laid on top of the guy, and he said, don't worry, this guy's alive. So he went back in, and he talked some more. And he talked until daylight, and he left. People, are you ready? Because church is just like two hours. <laughs> we could uh, talk to pastor, and we can have him do it for four or five hours. In Hebrews 10.24, it says, Forsake not the assembly of the church on the first day of the week. And we can minister one to another, preach a little sermon, break bread together, and that's the first day of the week. And give. Okay? That's break bread, preach a little, praise God a little bit, and praise God with your tithe. So hallelujah. And that's Hebrews 10, 24. So I'm going to encourage you this day. Help change a nation in Malawi and support the team that's in Yellowstone cleaning the mighty Merced River. <laughs> they have fun doing it anyway. <laughs> okay? So bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. Father, I thank you and praise you for the giver this morning, Father God. I praise that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that they cannot contain. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over into their laps, Father God. Rebuke the devourer at their doorstep. Yes, Lord. They don't need any troubles. So the giver can claim all of these promises, and God is faithful to fulfill them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bob. What a good reminder to give the first day of the week. That was really good. So today I have the privilege to announce to you the speaker, Dr. Dan Stewart. We all know him. And he's our brother and a blessing to this church. I have something right here to read 
to you guys about Mr. Dr. Dan Stewart. First of all, he loves God. Amen. We don't want someone up here who doesn't love God. <laughs> uh, and he loves his wife, Connie, and his three kids, along with his grandkids, above all else. Though he has been a pastor for over 40 plus years, traveled to Africa and, and Israel each year for training and raising up leaders, his heart is for equipping the next generation of Christ followers. He has been a pastor of four significant and healthy churches, been president of the Life Pacific College, taught at three universities, while always mentoring, sponsoring many young leaders. Currently, he teaches as an adjunct at Life Pacific University for 33 years, a Water of Life Church School of Ministry, and Azusa Pacific University. His dissertation on the Sermon on the Mount was published two years ago and is a great resource for anyone teaching through Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And he still loves to spend time in the water as much as possible, water, skiing, wakeboarding, and surfing. So welcome up our good friend, Dr. Dan Stewart. I told pastor I didn't want any more introductions and he made me send it. So, okay. Well, uh, nice to be here and he's given me some instructions. So do you know that uh, Bob didn't understand that he was gonna be prophetic today? Uh, we will probably go three hours, okay? So everybody hang on. Uh, as uh, Bet Davis said, fasten your seat belts, we're gonna be in for a bumpy ride, okay? Because uh, he, he asked me, my dissertation is on Matthew 5 through 7, and I understand that he's beginning a series in the book of Matthew. So he said, why don't you come and talk about the Sermon on the Mount? Now, he doesn't understand that the Sermon on the Mount, this and this is a short version, is in the book. I'd have to be here for the next eight weeks in order to cover the Beatitudes. So um, I picked one for today. And if you have not bought one of these, this is for my retirement fund. And so I, I brought some today. Um, they're 10 bucks a piece. And, and I would love for you, if you want to read something that Matthew 5 through 7, here you go. So I brought some. But um, I'm also supposed to give a PR for the Israel trip that we're going to be taking in May. So I'm leading a trip, God willing, with COVID and everything clears out and everything's good. We will be going. It'll be my 36th trip to Israel. Wow. So i um, been there a couple of times. And, uh, but uh, we're looking forward to it. I'll just give you just a teaser. First day, you'll start in Joppa, the ancient port city. You'll head from there to Caesarea Maritime, Caesarea on the sea, where Herod the Great built his fortress there and where a guy named Pontius Pilate lived. He did not like Jerusalem. He liked to be on the ocean. Smart guy. Um, then we will head from there to go to a place called Carmel or the Carmel Mountains, Mount Carmel. And we will go to the place of remembrance of where um, Elijah faced the prophets of Baal. From there, we will go down to a place called Megiddo, where we translate Armageddon and uh, the place where the great battle will take place someday in the future. We will go from there to a place called Nazareth. We will go to where Jesus was raised as a young boy. We will visit a synagogue um, in Nazareth. We will go from there down and journey down to the Sea of Galilee, spend the night. Your hotel is on the Sea of Galilee. That's the first day. That's just the first day. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Pastor Kurt, you sign up with Pastor Kurt because um, he said he's hitchhiking on this trip with me and um, he, he wants to head along. So anyway, we're, um, I thought I'd give you that 10 cents on that. Now, this is called eight is enough, meaning the eight Beatitudes. Uh, I believe that Jesus was the best teacher who ever lived on this planet. I believe he was an excellent teacher. 
If you want, so take your Bibles out with me or your phones or your iPads, whatever you have. I'm going to walk you quickly through what this book covers. Okay, so that means that'll be the first hour. Then the second hour, I will get to the message. How's that? Okay, so let's go to um, Matthew chapter 5, please. Matthew, book of Matthew, uh, a wonderful writer. Matthew was certainly knowledgeable of the written language and um, of what Jesus was establishing as the Son of God and also a marvelous teacher. Um, I'm going to use something called a chiasm. A chiasm means inverted order. There are a lot of chiasms in the Bible, a lot of chiasm, chiasms in the world. But let me give you one. It's where the first and the last explain each other. That's what a chiasm is. It means the first and the last explain each other. Here's a chiasm. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And it says, it says learn from me, for I'm humble and gentle of heart. My yoke is easy. My burden is what? Light. Light. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Right? What's the last say? My yoke is easy, my burden is light. So the last answers the first. That's called chiasm, okay? That's a chiasm. The Bible is filled with those. But let's go to Beatitudes, something that I came across 40 years ago. Um, it's not the only way to interpret the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, but um, I took it to heart. Here we go. Um, it says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him and began to teach. I'm going to move this. I think I'm making noises in it. Hold on, folks. Okay, maybe that'll be better. Okay, here we go. And he began to teach them. And he gives eight beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you will go down to verse 10, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you notice the first and the last have the same ending? Okay, so that makes, that's, that's a great point. Blessed means congratulations. That's how you would translate it. Congratulations on being persecuted. Congratulations on you being righteous and hunger. Congratulations. That's exactly what the word translate means. Happy are you. Happy should you be because of these things. And by the way, for anybody who is interested, this is not particular. This is not point in time. This means it's ongoing. Blessed are you if this is ongoing in your life. Blessed are you if this continually is experienced. Blessed are you when this is something that is a way of life. Okay? It's not something you just go, well, check that one off. I was righteous today. Check this one off. I was persecuted today. Um, and we think persecution is because I couldn't find a parking place. Now, that to me is persecution because I had to walk all the way down the street and carry a box and everything else over here, but that's not what it means. Blessed are you when you're persecuted, he says, because of me. That's persecution. When you are living for Christ and people come against that, but we're not going to talk about that fully. All right, here we go. Uh, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those that meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is where we start to invert the order. Okay? We're going to take the Beatitudes, and we're going to use them as the outline for the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the eight points for the rest of chapter 5, 6, and 7. Okay? Everybody with me? All right. Here we go. Sorry, Pastor Kurt is the one who asked me to do this. So, yep, blame him. Notice what verse 11, what, what does verse 11 start with? 
Blessed are you when people do what? When they persecute you, say falsely and evil against you because of me. What's the last beatitude? Blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So eventually, right immediately, what does Jesus begin to do? He explains to you what it means to be persecuted. Here's what it means to be persecuted because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Your reward's in heaven if people of men come against you because of these things. You are the salt of the earth. You are it, salt is what you become as a Christian. It's not something, it's what you are. And salt irritates people. It is also used for purification. So when you go into a place as a believer and there's a lot of unbelievers, they will get antsy. Mm -hmm. They just do. It makes them uncomfortable. Have you ever been around somebody who constantly says, oh, I'm sorry for my language. I'm sorry for my language. I'm sorry for my language. Why? Because you're salt, you're irritating, you're irritating them. I mean, come on, what would the world be like without Christians? I mean, <laughs> we're the things that everybody makes fun of. And yet, that's an amazing point that we are salt. And it says you also, and guess what? Salt is what they used to put in the roads to kill the weeds. Romans used it in all the roads. Salt, they would salt the roads. And it says, if you lose your saltiness, which is impossible because it's what we are, we're salt. But if you get diluted, you're only good for one thing, to be thrown out and trampled on by men. And any Christian in this world who says they follow Christ and then slip up and go and do something really bad, what happens? The world tears them to pieces, tears them to pieces, throws them out. And, that, and he says, and you're only good to be trampled on by men. That's what he's talking about. And he says, your light, city set on a hill, cannot be hidden. And he goes on to explain what does it mean that he didn't come to get rid of the prophets, um, but to abolish them. But, I mean, the word, really, the, the law, he said, I've come to fulfill it. And, um, and once again, he tells you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven and that's exactly what the beatitude ends with blessed are the persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of heaven that concludes that particular it's called a pericope it's a paragraph it ends the teaching there and notice in verse 21 what does it begin with you have heard it said that changes subject he's changing the subject now What's the next beatitude inverted? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Notice what it talks about. You have heard that it was said long ago, don't murder, and you'll be subject to judgment. I tell you, anyone who's angry with his brother and anyone who calls his brother raka, which means empty-headed, is in danger of the fire of hell. A peacemaker goes out of their way to make peace, and it tells you how to go to your brother and be reconciled with your brother and if you don't, you pay the last cent. And he talks about what does it mean to be a peacemaker. But all of a sudden, look again in verse 27. What's it start with? You have heard, he's changing subject again. He's changing the subject. Let's go to the next beatitude inverted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? Blessed are the pure in heart. Notice how this starts. You have heard said long ago, don't commit adultery. I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So he begins to explain what does it mean to be pure in heart. And that's, he talks about murder, talks about adultery, talks about divorce. Then it goes on and he ends that subject. And in verse... Um, if you will, 33, it says, again, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, don't break your oath and um, to show them what to do. But let's go down to verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, if you will with me, let's go to the next beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, but I'll tell you, don't resist an evil person. If somebody strikes you, he shows you how to be a merciful person. Once again, that's how the Beatitudes are the outline for the rest of the Sermon on the Mount 
in an inverted order. Everybody follow? Okay. I don't have time to go through all of this. It would take too long. But I do have a book that is being sold like hotcakes flying off out of my hands. Anyway, okay. I'm going to choose the fifth beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So, eight is enough. My wife spends an enormous amount of time on the worst thing that I think there is on this planet. This. I do not like doing puzzles. Ugh. And she'll sit there for hours and look. I wish I could tell you I took this from one of her puzzles just so that she, <laughs> but I didn't, okay? I didn't. Um, <laughs> it would be fun. Um, and and it, that's why with our lives, things are puzzles. And, and there's a lot of things I like to do with puzzles, but not those kind of puzzles. I like, if, if something's wrong with a car, I don't mind. I got to find out what this is. What's the puzzle? What, what are the things happening here? And that's the same. And let's face it, some things in life are just a puzzle. Women are a puzzle. Oh. It's just, um, yeah. Computers. They're, they're a wonder, you know. Yes, they are. And uh, my son-in-law is great with computers. My computer doesn't work. He'll tell me within two seconds he's using language I have no knowledge of. I have no idea what he's talking about. But I like things that are a puzzle, and I, I brought a couple of puzzles for you. In fact, I'll give my book to anybody in this room who knows what this is. This was on a, a fence post. It was on a fence post holding two posts together. And my dad knew what it was. And it unlocks. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> they open the gate. It, it says on here. Can you can you read the first line? Security auto theft signal system. And what will it offer you if someone steals the car? No. It it says I'll give you a hundred dollars if somebody steals a car with this on it. This is called a wheel hobble. And you put it through the spokes on a Model T and lock it onto the wheel so that when they're driving, it would go clunk, clunk. And they made different points so you'd know it was yours and you could follow it down the road if somebody was trying to drive it away. Uh, Model Ts were $400. They would give you $100 if you used their system. I had no idea what this, my dad did, but I had no idea. It was a puzzle. So now you know. The, yeah. I used to collect these. This one is particular. This is, this is basically a whiskey bottle. It's what it would have been used for. But bottles, um, if you'll notice, it has, see it has a crease on it right there. But notice it doesn't go up all the way. What they did with bottles in the 18, late 1800s, bottles were made with the same top on a, a thousand different bottles. So they, they blew the flasks or made the flask and then put a different, the top went on <laughs> Listerine, it went on anything that they had. These tops were the same because they didn't want to make different tops. You can tell if a, a jar is over 100 years old if the crease doesn't go all the way to the top. If it goes all the way to the top, it was formed much later and they put them together. But this was, it, you know if something's older, also the bubbles are a dead giveaway that it was made before the 1900s. So um, in this particular one, it still had a piece of cork in it. But I used to dig these out of the dirt at my grandmother's house in Missouri. And I learned a lot about bottles because they were puzzling to me. How come this didn't have this? Well, it's part of that puzzle. So 
the Beatitudes, and we're going to call it eight is enough, Matthew 5 through 7, piecing together the puzzle of life. But you have notes in front of you, don't you? Yes. Bob, did everyone get notes? Yes. Okay. Bob got a hold of it, so this is good. We're doing part five. How many of you watched Star Wars, the first movie in the 70s when it came out? It was part five. So we're being just like Star Wars. We're starting with part five. Thank you, Bob. We appreciate it. Okay, so let's read what we're focusing on this time in Matthew chapter 5, 6. Here it is. Blessed are those, let's read it together. Bless it with me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Amen to that. Have you ever eaten and filled up on something? Uh, <laughs> Thanksgiving, you get this wonderful meal that's being prepared for you, and the kids sit around and eat potato chips and dip, and then by the time of really good food comes around, they're full. Anybody ever done that? Um, and so w you fill up yourself, but those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, what will happen? You'll be filled. In the Antarctic summer of 1908 and 1909, Sir Ernest Shackleton and three companions attempted to travel to the South Pole to their winter quarters. They set off with four ponies to help carry the load. Weeks later, the ponies were dead. Their rations were exhausted. They turned back towards their base, their goal not accomplished. Altogether, they trekked for 127 days. On the return journey, Shackleton records in the heart of the Antarctic, the time was spent talking about food 24 hours a day. They've talked about elaborate feasts, gourmet delights, sumptuous menus. They staggered along suffering from dysentery, not knowing whether they would even survive, and every waking hour was occupied with thoughts of eating. Jesus, who also knew the ravages of food depriva deprivation, said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We can understand Shackleton's obsession with food, which offers a glimpse of the passion Jesus intends for our quest for righteousness. You must hunger for righteousness. And listen, we don't really know anything about God unless he tells us about himself, and that's what we have with the word of God. Righteousness means a right choice or a just action. A right choice or a just action, which is right here in your notes. And that's why um, it, it means that you find a life of satisfaction. Mick Jagger, when he was so much younger, um, said, I can't get no satisfaction. I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried. Fulfillment. Fulfillment. And when you're ready um, to quit, start hungering for something of righteousness. And that's why to, to hunger for righteousness, happy you, congratulations, when you hunger for righteousness. It means to be starving, to be famished, to thirst. And it, there is absolutely a vital connection between the act of justifying and the righteousness of the individual who has been justified. There is a combination and a connection between those two. And that's why it talks about the righteousness of God. Um, so... Our friends here, the righteousness means a right choice or a just action. Thank you so much, guys, for getting this straightened out. Um, the right connection, the righteousness of God, look at Romans 3.21. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. There is a righteousness of God. And we can translate that, if you will, to a God-like righteousness. And so a God-like righteousness is also seen in the book of Ephesians. And to do what? Put on the new self 
created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You have to put on this new self and to be satisfied. It says, blessed are you for you will be filled or satisfied. It means to gorge yourself. It means to be so full, there's nothing else left. That's why we should hunger and thirst for righteousness. And um, we're going to see how this is interpreted through Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. So everybody, let's go. Um, you can open your Bible, but I have it on the handy dandy screen. Okay, so here we go. Isn't it interesting how it works out? What's the, what's the beatitude? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. Righteousness, for you shall be filled or satisfied. Look what it starts out with. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness. So we see how the Bible can be in an inverted order. The Beatitudes become the outline for the rest of the sermon. Trust me, I have read books that they've taken the Beatitudes and never mentioned the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. I've also seen it where they've done the Sermon on the Mount and never mentioned the Beatitudes. So there's, yes, sir. I'm sorry, just one more question. Is it, is it uh, both the righteousness of, of your action and the righteousness of the people that it was uh, out in public or in your immediate? Well, you hit the first part. The first part would be your actions being, if you will, the righteousness of God. You're, you're acting that out. And the world will witness that. And he's going to show us some very specific things. And one of those things is giving. We're going to talk about that. The second one is prayer. And the third one is fasting. And he talks about these acts of righteousness and how we abuse them. Okay. Now, um, if you do these things before who? People, men, to be seen by them, if you do... You will have no reward from your Father in heaven. That word reward is this. It is the word applause. If you do your acts of righteousness, if you go clean the Merced River so that people will applaud you, guess what you have? Your reward in full. That's it. If you live for applause, that's all you get. There's nothing eternal. There's nothing else coming. It's what you get on this earth when people acknowledge you. That's it. That's your reward. And you then have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites did in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. If they had a lot of money, they had people toot horns. And you came in and they said, oh, Oh, look at them. Look how much they're giving. You got your reward in full. Good for you. And it says, I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. There's nothing else. How many of you would rather have Jesus on the day of judgment standing before him? He'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the Lord than say, sorry, you didn't have much. You got all your applause on earth. That's a problem. Oh, so when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand, we're going to come back to this, is doing so that your giving may be in secret. When your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing on the synagogues or on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. So if you think you're praying to God, but you're praying so men can hear you, that was a really super duper prayer. Yeah. So when you pray, go where? Go by yourself. Be alone. Close the door. Don't pray before men. You pray to the Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. And that reward is satisfying. Okay? 
Now, and when you pray, don't keep babbling like pagans. Have you ever heard somebody pray like this? Jesus, oh Jesus, I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for all you, Jesus, all you've done, Jesus. And Jesus, that's really good, Jesus. Top notch, Jesus. Thanks so much, Jesus. Do you think you get points because you mention Jesus' name more than other people? Do you talk like this? Hey, Bob, how you doing, Bob? Bob, are you coming over today, Bob? Bob, I don't know if I know you, Bob. Hey, Bob. We don't talk like that. So I said, don't be like the pagans who want to be known for their many words. Don't, don't do that. That's, it's babbling. It's, it's, it's nothing. Let your father see what is in secret. They'll be heard for their many words. <laughs> you used to have a guy who was on our council. I loved him. He was a wonderful man. I never asked him to pray during a council meeting. <laughs> if I said open the meeting, it would be 25 minutes later. He's still going. <laughs> well done. Listen, your father knows what you need before you ask him. That's why I told you guys several times. My next book for my retirement fund will be called 18 Seconds because 90% of the prayers in the Bible are less than 18 seconds. Less than 18 seconds. Look at this. Pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. And if you have an older translation, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 15 seconds, folks. 15 seconds. When you want to pray, pray this way. If you forgive men and they have sinned against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Ooh. If you don't forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. <sighs> yeah. When you fast, don't look somber like the hypocrites do. When I was growing up, uh, as a beginning Christian, we were told that if you told people you were fasting, there was no reward in it. You broke the fast. So when, <sighs> we'd go out after church. We're all sitting around the table, people are ordering, and you're going, what's wrong? Nothing. Well, why don't you order something? No. I'm fasting. Give me some French fries. So uh, you <laughs> when you're fasting, nobody should know you're fasting, folks. Or you get what? Oh, that was a good fast. You get your reward in full. I tell you the truth, they received their reward in full. When you fast, put oil on your head. And they used to put oil and wash their hair with olive oil. Yeah. Their hair was pretty greasy, yeah. but it was also medicinal, so it kept it bugs and stuff from landing in it. But put oil on your face, on your hair. Mm -hmm. Wash your face so it doesn't look... You know, that you look like fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. Okay. And then the beatitude ends, and it goes on. Jesus does another teaching on generosity yeah. and giving. And he talks, and he changes that. Um, and once again, um, uh, he, the next, it's the next beatitude that explain that, but we're focusing on this one. All right, here we go. Reward means wages or payment, full or deferred, and uh, it also is taken from. Ooh. <laughs> they got me, folks. <laughs> um, <laughs> we must be visible. Listen to this. We must be visible in this world, but never for visibility. I'll say it again. We must be visible in this world, but never for visibility. God guards 
his glory. You sang a song, glory in the highest. God shares his glory with nobody. It is his and his alone. And so that's why, uh, I don't know if this is on here or not. We're going to find out. Um, <coughs> no. Isaiah 66.5 says this, let the Lord be glorified. John 21.9 says, it signified the death by which Peter would glorify God. And that's why Genesis 15.1 says this, Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield and your very great reward. Psalm 19.11, In keeping the commandments, there is great reward. Psalm 58.11, Surely the righteous will be rewarded. Revelation 22, 12, behold, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me. That's why the word hypocrite, don't be like hypocrites, it's taken from the word to be on a stage and to have a, um, the word hypocrite actually is taken from the word, or derivative of the words, without Wax, without wax. They used to build statues out of marble in the Greek time. And they would put them in a garden. Sometimes they were chipping away and the nose fell off. What are you going to do? It's got a whole statue and the nose is gone. They used wax and they put the nose back on and they sold the statue. To be a hypocrite or to be insincere it means to be without wax because the wax meant you were covering you were doing something that you were not supposed to do or to be um, that's why hypocrites uh, are not genuine and that's why this first thing here giving means um, the act of personal recognition Never trade a hidden reward for an outward recognition. Never trade what the Father will give you in secret than for what men will acknowledge you for. And that's not to say that this reward, uh, this honor was given not because you sought it out, but because of service. Um, it's not for men. If, that's, if you did it just to be recognized by men, then that's your reward. But if you do it to honor the Lord, to honor his world, very, very different reward from that. That's why um, this covers three things, and it covers this in this, in this giving. Trumpets of self-praise, baskets of self-attention, and hands of self-proclamation. Don't let people announce with a trumpet that you're, you're coming to church. And uh, we used to have I pastored in Oregon, and we used to have a very well-known, um, I'm not even going to say who it was, uh, a very wealthy individual who was well-known well known in the world. Um, and, you know, she never announced herself. She never, you know, the only thing that I knew about her was that she had a bulletproof Hummer. So, because uh, I had never known anybody who had a bulletproof Hummer. Um, and, and so, when you talk about this recognition um, and putting it in, like in here, if you'll notice, um, these envelopes actually are very biblical. When you give, give so that nobody knows. Only the Father knows. You don't give to somebody recognize it. And, it, and, then, and that's why they had these bowls that were made out of brass and they, had, they made noise. So when you threw coins into it, the more noise it made, did you hear how much they put in there? Oh, boy. Um, it also says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You ever wondered what does that mean? I'll show you. What if we went into church and we did this, okay? Let's say the offering plate was coming by or I come out 
in front. Um, notice I have a whole lot of ones. That's what my wife gives me. Um, I don't even know how this got in there because I don't ever get this. But um, what if you're in church and the basket's coming by and you, and you do this? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And people go, did you see how much money they put in there? He says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, when you put it in, just put it in one hand. Nobody sees. You're not doing it for recognition. Because then if they recognize it, they go, oh. I, I'll leave the tin in the basket just because. Makes you look good. can see how easy that is. Self-proclamation where people don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Um, giving is worship and nothing satisfies but worship. It is not about us. Self-proclamation, right hand, left hand reward, it's not satisfying. Why do you think people... I just saw this note. The Rolling Stones are going to tour again. Their average age is 78. The drummer's 80, and he won't be able to go with them because he had surgery. Okay, come on. Let, let's face it. Why do they keep doing it? Uh, it's not the money. They're loaded. They got money at the wazoo. What, why are they doing it? Because they need the applause. When that goes away, they're nothing. That's the reward in full. Why do you think people keep performing? Because somebody will keep clapping. Listen, when we worship God, we don't do it for self-recognition. We do it to glorify him. And that's why if there's worship leaders that are up there dancing around and, they're, and trying to, you know, which you never do, you do <laughs> dance a little bit every once in a while. But <laughs> are we doing it so that he, if, you know, if you go, oh, it's not fulfilling, folks. It never satisfies. Alms means uh, the acts of righteousness. That's a tr the translation from the Hebrew is giving alms. And alms is, we have digressed it into money. But it doesn't, alms in the biblical sense was acts of righteousness. Giving to the needy, feeding the poor, sharing your wealth, um, and that's why when, when we reach out, if you teach a Sunday school class, if you go on a missions trip to Malawi, if you reach out to those on the, on the boardwalk and, and, and feed those in need, all of those are called acts of righteousness or alms. And you don't do it to be recognized. And that's why we want it to be able to do by um, visually, but never for recognition. Be visible, but never for visibility. Okay? That's, the, that's what Jesus is hitting here, especially with this particular beatitude. That's giving. The second one is called prayer. The act of spiritual recognition. We'll find a way to be recognized one way or the other. And um, 1968, Newsweek, front cover, said this, can modern man pray? Hmm. In the age of communication, we have email, snail mail, we have cell phones, we have iPads, we have portable phones, we have computers, we have, we have, we have, we have. Yeah. <laughs> little room for the spiritual, little room for it. Our world is too sophisticated for God to work in, right? Does God understand computers? I know I don't. <laughs> John Wesley said, I hold a very poor view of any Christian wait for it, who does not pray four hours a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 
We are not actors. We're not actors. We're not hypocrites. We're not phony people with a phony voice and phony language. If there, and there used to be people who prayed. They, they only prayed in King James English. Come on. Yea, and verily I say unto thee. What? Why do you do that? Because you don't talk like that. So when you pray, talk to God the way you talk to people. Prayer means God uses it to give us what he wants. Illustration. Most of my presents that I got for my children on Christmas, I paid for. <laughs> Come on, anybody relate to that? You gave them money to buy you a present. So when you get the present, oh, thank you for this necktie. I really like this tie, and I bought it. It's not, it is absolutely no different with God. God gives us everything. And so we give him back 10%, and we act like we've done something big. And God says, wow, that's awesome. You gave me 10% back. I gave you 100%. When you pray, don't be phony in it. And that's why the problem of prayer it focuses too much on us, not on the one we're praying to. Wanted to be recognized as one who prays. <laughs> Making prayer way too formal. Long, repetitious babbling. Prayer is a weapon. It is a sword that the Holy Spirit yields and pray when nobody knows. Pray when you doubt. Pray even before because he knows what you need. And that's why the Lord's Prayer is such an awesome part. And I don't know if it's on this or not. Let's see. No, it's not. Okay. I'm going to walk this fairly quickly with you. Our Father, it settles our world. When you say our Father, it settles our relationship to each other. Our Father, it settles our relationship to God. Pray in this way. In heaven, it means his holiness, his place of dwelling. Hallowed be your name. It is the unique place of God's character. He is holy and we are not. Your kingdom come. It means it's breaking forth. Your will be done. His rulership. Primary object of prayer is the rulership of God. Give today our daily bread. Never presume. Never be presumptuous. Every time we sit down to eat, I'd say 98% of the time, whether it's a bowl of cereal or whether it's a full meal, we'll pray. God, thank you for this. Be with our family today. Um, forgiveness. Forgive those who have trespassed against you. It's the key to faith. It's forgiveness. Pray in that way. And the third one for acts of righteousness is fasting. <sighs> Concealing the physical and the spiritual. There's many types of fasting. There's a Dan called it the Daniel fast, where you don't eat anything other than fruits, vegetables, nuts, that kind of stuff. It's almost like a vegan diet. And there's a lot of people that do that. By the way, fasting is not dieting, okay? That's not what it is. Dieting is dieting. So you don't fast to lose weight. You fast to be closer to God. Now, if you think about fasting, how much time do you spend thinking about food? How much time do you think of, that you deal with preparation? How much time do you have to do cleanup? If you take all of that time and prayed, it's a lot of time. Yeah. 
And it would mean that you let go of something that you could normally do. I try every day, best I can, to set something aside and fast it every day of something I could have. Sometimes I, I, you can get a candy bar and just put it on your desk, but don't eat it because I'm saying no to that. I'm going to fast that today. Do you know you need to say no to things in your life that you could say yes to? You just need to simply say, you know, not everything in this world is yes. Sometimes you have to say no. And, and so there's, there's all types of fasting. Jesus did a 40-day fast. Those are a bear. But I will tell you, after three days of fasting, you won't be hungry anymore. Your hunger stops. It literally stops. You have to keep drinking um, so you have fluids. But if you did a 40-day fast, after about three to four days, you're no longer hungry. Now, I don't think you should go watch television and they have Big Macs. and <laughs> They'll have everything that you want at that time. But I will tell you, it does make a difference um, after a period of time. Um, and fasting is far more than not eating. Prayer is essential to fasting. Because fasting is seen in deliverance, sicknesses being gone, even death being people raised from the dead. People fasted and prayed. When you're fasting, forget what other people think. Who cares? When you're fasting, be concerned about one thing, God and God alone. And when you fast, be normal. I know it's hard for some of you because some of you aren't normal. So... <laughs> And that's good. That's good. But when you fast, be your same. Nobody should know. Nobody should know you're fasting. And it, it's because you're, you're doing it to honor God, not for somebody to go, oh, you're fasting again? You're our faster. Yeah. So, um, a restored hunger. Remember, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You shall be filled, engorged, where you, there's nothing else. Psalm 34, 9. No, wait, wait, let me see. Get this up here. So it's the act of blending the personal and the spiritual. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see. The Lord is good. So, three questions for you. Number one, what in your life have you filled up on but still feel empty? Do you know that the average man who watches porn watches an average of four hours at a time? And they will tell you, those addicted to porn will tell you, it never satisfies. It never satisfies, no matter how many hours you watch it. What in your life have you filled up on, but you still feel empty? Because see, blessed are those, congratulations to you, on those who hunger for righteous things, acts of righteousness. Let the Father repay you. Amen. How could you improve your times of prayer? What could you do? Remember I told you 18 seconds, that's the length of most of the prayers in the Bible, 90% of them. Just praying, I, I just think, I like to pray little short prayers all day long. You know? You know? And nobody knows I'm doing it. You know, when somebody, if I tell somebody, and by the way, if I tell you, I'll be praying for you, I'll probably walk out the door and pray for you because I don't want to forget. So I'm going to pray. And I, hey, listen, I believe in 18-second prayers. I believe they can move the heart of God. Thirdly, are there things you could fast to draw you closer to God? Maybe you need to sign off on the old television for a while, fast media. Maybe you just need to not look at what's going on in the world if you're addicted to the news. Shut it down and maybe just spend some time listening to what God might want to say to you. And there are times, because I, I, I just drove here today with 900 million other people, 
man, there was traffic today. They're all going to the Redondo Beach. <laughs> I know why. Free ice cream today. If you find the McDonald's something or another in Redondo Beach is giving out free ice cream today. That's probably where they were all going. <laughs> but anyway, um, just to understand. What could you do? What could you fast? Simply to say, to draw closer to God. And so there are times when I'm driving, I just turn off the music, turn off the radio, and just listen. Maybe God wants to say something to me while I'm driving. I don't close my eyes. It's a little dangerous. <laughs> but, but I can pray. And uh, whatever he brings to mind, that's good. Let's pray together, shall we? Jesus, Thank you for these good people and for the time that they've spent listening to your word. Thank you for the book of Matthew. It's such a wonderful book, especially for chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. I pray, Lord, you take the word and apply it to our hearts and lives. There's so many different ways to interpret your word, so many different ways to apply it to our lives. Thank you, Lord, for these good people who have listened and now give us application. Lord, what are the things that we could fast that would draw us closer to you? How could you increase our prayer life? How could you, Lord, have us do things not to be seen by men, but to be seen by our Father who's in heaven? May our giving, Lord, not be one hand or the other so people can see what we're doing, but we pay and give in secret. And I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing with Pastor Kurt, this family, and with this church. May Malawi continue to find fresh water. Not that breakwater would be recognized, but that you would be glorified in all things. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. It's always a pleasure being here with you. And um, so if you want to come up, yeah, thank you. If you oh, no, don't clap. Just kidding. Just kidding. Thank you, Dan. What a pleasure. All the way from Arrowhead. I thought about him at 6.30 this morning when I woke up. Bless, you're a blessed man. Amen. Congratulations. <laughs> Stand if you can and let's worship the God that gave us the message. In Jesus' name.
Yeah, sure. Lord, thank you so much for uh, your great name, Lord. Thank you that you are holy, Lord. I pray, God, that, that we would take away this message, Lord, that we would remember the Beatitudes. Thank you, Lord, for the message that it tied in the Beatitudes and then the things that um, Jesus says afterwards, Lord, about um, do not be impure in heart if you look at a woman. Thank you, God, that all these things, Lord, are tied together. We can make that connection, God. I just pray that you would bless uh, Pastor Dan Stewart, Lord, and th thank you so much, God, for his knowledge, Lord. I just, yes, it was such a blessing, Lord, to hear him preach. Um, and just bless this day, God. Bless this Sunday. I pray, Lord, that we would we would just say those prayers in our head, Lord, that we would spend time thinking about fasting from things we need to fast, God, and that we would uh, do our acts of righteousness in our heart, not to be seen before men. In Jesus' name, amen, Lord. Thank you so much for preaching. So good. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you, Jesus, for this well, beautiful you, day you've given us. Will you guys pray for me because I'm having my baby on Thursday? <laughs>